<laughs> Norby, thanks so much for being with us. Uh, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about yourself, where you're from, how long you've been juggling, and what you're most excited about when it comes to juggling right now. All right. I'm um, from England originally, although I was born in Spain. Now I live in Canada. I've been here for eight years, and I recently became a permanent resident of Canada. I've been right. juggling since I started Diablo in the year 2000, and then like uh, pure juggling in 2002. And currently, I'd say head bouncing and head bouncing on a balance is what inspires me to go to practice every day. Mm -hmm. um, another interesting thing I was wondering about, I saw on the Juggle Wiki, is your name's a little bit longer than Norby. I was wondering if you could tell us what your full name is. My full name is Thomas Norbert Stanley Bunker Whitney. And how did you end up with Norby? <laughs> Well, originally, actually, my parents wanted Norby, so Norbert is, it's not very common, but France, Spain, Germany, they all have Norbert. It's a pretty common name. So they wanted to give me that, but my grandparents apparently said it wasn't a respectful enough name, so they had to give me something more classic, mm. which is where the Thomas came from. And the okay. Stanley was a bit of a tradition. I think my grand, great-grandfather and his dad were called Stanley. Mm. so yeah a bit of everything all right so it wasn't quite regal enough so they gave <laughs> you a real name but then they called you what they wanted to anyway yeah um just to make the grandparents happy <laughs> now i was wondering if you could tell us uh, a little bit more about this head bouncing thing why'd you get into head bouncing uh i think when you get to a certain point in juggling when i got to a certain point in juggling everything <laughs> that i wanted to learn was too difficult i mean, yeah I think in this day and age, we want instant satisfaction and we want to learn something every day. And we can't anymore because we're not at the first like week of our juggling. <laughs> so within everything I was already practicing, it was just doing longer runs and doing harder versions. And I wanted to go in a different direction. So I decided on head bouncing because I had zero experience in it. So starting from the very beginning, I like re experienced those first steps of learning juggling from the very beginning again mm. which is both frustrating and also very rewarding so that was nice all right so speaking about kind of how you started and the direction you went tell us a little bit about your journey what inspired you to juggle well both my parents were musicians with traveling circuses when i was a child so i was around the the circus since i was a baby my mom tried to teach me a few times to juggle and I was never interested. And then at a circus festival in 2000, at the end of the festival, I was there because my parents were managing one of the shows. Mm -hmm. and at the end of the festival, someone had left their Diablo in the lost and found and no one claimed it. So I took it home and I learned a few tricks. And then my mom bought me a Donald Grant Diablo book. I think my first Diablo book, maybe. And I'd learned everything in it in a week, and I figured I'm the best in the world. There you go. I can do all the tricks that exist <laughs> in Diablo. Mm -hmm. And then, then I met someone in the park who had tricks that weren't in the book. <laughs> and that, I was, oh, okay, we can do other things than what's already written down. So that sort of, yeah, that was the very beginning, was a complete accident. And then I just got hooked on it. And then two years later, I noticed that a lot of my friends could juggle three balls, even though none of them cared about juggling. And I figured, I already do Diablo. I should probably add that to my repertoire as well. And I got hooked. I learned three balls, and then I learned some tricks with three balls, and then I wanted to do rings and clubs, and, you know, the rest is juggling history. So what kind of kept you into it? Was it just learning each new prop? The community kept me into juggling. I think at the very beginning, when rec juggling was still popular, Mm -hmm. I was probably one of those annoying kids that people would block these days. <laughs> but uh, I was very active on the internet. Everyone wanted to to help out and just, there was so much love being shared around. And uh, I went to my first festival in 2004, the BJC in Derby. And everyone was just so friendly and everything I was doing, everyone had uh, variations on it or comments about it. And just like, it was a huge trick share for a week. And it just like 
completely blew my mind about this side of juggling. Mm -hmm. And yeah, the community, having the community there all the time, always pushing each other and helping each other and being so cool to each other is was hugely why I started and kept juggling. And then later on, it became my profession. So it was kind of an obligation. So what uh, or who would you say encouraged you the most to keep going? At the beginning, it was John Udry, juggler from England. He was okay. one of my first juggling friends. He's the one you just he just linked to his page a couple of days ago. Yeah, he's doing a Kickstarter at the moment with Void. They're creating a tour around England, mm -hmm. going to uh, places decided by the funders. So that's cool. Mm -hmm. He and Aaron Sparks, who um, together we created like a bit of a team we called Hyper Mega Three Thousand, which was I don't know, it was just a fun little thing for adolescents to do, and it together we. I don't know, we didn't really do anything as such, but it was such a important thing to just help us all progress and have fun. And that was a big players for me. And then after the festivals, there was a guy, Robin Gunny, who lived in Exeter, where I lived. He showed me the juggling club and also I met Matt Pang. And yeah, a bunch of people that aren't really known, but were huge in making sure I kept juggling and pushed my juggling. John Udry actually contacted me before my first ever festival. He wanted to come down to my town and he knew I was living there and he said, hey, let's meet up and, you know, I'm a juggler. But at the time, I'd only been juggling for maybe six months and I was scared of this sort of meeting someone I didn't know situation. Mm -hmm. So I kind of, I just declined and said, oh no, thanks, you know, whatever. And then when I met him at the first BJC, we became friends on the spot. And, uh, so uh, I want to take a moment to tell you guys about our sponsors. Um, also say sorry about my daughter being really loud. I feel bad about that. But hey, I've got a daughter. So what are you going to do? As you know, Marvin Ong's or Master Ong's Prop Shop, that is one of our sponsors giving away a ticket. It's $150 value to Manipulation, the festival they put on every year. If you want to be entered that contest, make sure you hashtag mops in a comment. And then also Chris Kelly who I'm sure you know is a poi juggler, the poi juggler really, um, is giving away a set of his poi. Just comment and you'll be entered to win that. You can also win an IJA membership and uh, Lido Dittmar's, a copy of Lido Dittmar's book, Fast Juggling Success. Um, a lot of great stuff in there. So just a big thank you to those guys. And back to questions. So tell us about a time in your juggling career, Norby, where, or not even your career, just your juggling I don't know, your hobby. At some point when you were juggling, you were like, this is exactly where I'm supposed to be. Maybe it was watching a performance or a practice or, uh, in your case, maybe it was filming some juggling. When I knew that this is where I wanted to be. It's every time I'm on stage. I think the first time was probably BJC in Perth. I don't know what year that was. But I won um, an award in the British Young Juggler of the Year competition. And it was voted for by some big names. There's a Respini Brothers and uh, I can't remember who else was judging. Maybe some festival organizers in the UK. And at that point, I definitely upgraded from a hobby juggler to, oh, this could be a career path for me. And to have that appreciation from the whole crowd and those longtime professional jugglers went, okay, yeah. This is, I had so much fun on stage and the audience reaction and just, yeah, everything about that situation told me that I wanted to keep doing that and do that better and better. Mm. And uh, how would you say that juggling has changed your life for the better since then? Juggling has taken me around the world. You know, first of all, juggling has let me voyage to places I wouldn't have gone on my own last summer I was in Australia and I wanted to go to Australia forever it's been on my list of places to go and then the a couple of circus schools over there called me up Fruit Fly Circus School and NICA the National Circus School in Melbourne and they said hey come on over and and spend a month and a half in Australia teaching juggling and like, well yes absolutely <laughs> you know <laughs> the juggling has let me see parts of the world I would have never gone on my own and also meet people whether they influenced my whole career path or just one single day the community is so powerful in juggling and it's 
yeah, it's it's. Hard. I'm sure there's communities like that in every in every hobby, but it's so hard to explain and describe the fact that you can be going to a town you've never been before, post on Facebook, hey, I'm going to be in your town this evening, and then suddenly there's like a bunch of people you never know want to meet up with you within juggling. <laughs> We're in incredibly social, right? So all these people that normally wouldn't talk to others in public or wouldn't really want to go outside and show off their stuff as soon as they get to a festival and there's a thousand other like-minded people it's it's definitely affects everyone in such a positive way mm -hmm. all right we're going to go to some viewer questions so uh from rob rob beast why did you decide to study at the circus school of quebec it was actually an accident <laughs> I wanted to study in Sweden with Wes. Okay. I think, I think everybody did at the beginning. I was in England. I was training on my own every night for months on end, just juggling, juggling, juggling. No outside inf influence. Occasionally I go to a juggling club with one or two people, but I realized that either I needed to do something else, I need to push my juggling to the next level um, professionally, or I was going to stop juggling altogether. Those are like my two options. Mm -hmm. So I figured if I was going to go to a juggling uh, circus school, then I didn't want to go to circus space or circus media in England because I wanted to change my whole culture as well. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to just, you know, do learn circus. I wanted to learn circus and also experience a whole new world. So I thought about it, not too far, but I thought about it. And then I was invited to the RIT Spring Juggling Mm -hmm. in rochester new york in 2006 okay and so, you still, west. You so you still ended up where west was <laughs> <laughs> yeah and west was at the festival and we were talking about it and he was about to go and do the auditions for sweden okay for stockholm so we were talking about it and we thought hey why don't i do the auditions as well and you know we had a cool chat about going to school together and we called up Jay and he said, sorry, the deadline for applications is passed. Uh. And the next audition is in two years because they do it every two years. Right. Anyway. Bummer. So I thought, okay, fine. I'll think about other plans. And the MC of the show at RIT was the juggling coach at Quebec City Circus School. Okay. And I was performing in the show. So he said to me, hey, you should come to Quebec school and uh, you know, go to circus school in Quebec. And at first I wasn't actually interested because I don't know, I, I really wanted to go to Sweden, but I found out that you could audition for Quebec. If you live thousands of miles away, you can audition by DVD. So my plan was don't lose out. Just send like it costs 15, 20 bucks to send a DVD audition. And then they're going to give you comments. You need to work on this. You need to work on this. This could be better. This is great. Blah, blah, blah. Which means I'll be more prepared for Stockholm the year after. That was my original plan. But then Quebec said yes. I had <laughs> totally didn't expect them to say yes. So they said yes. That was in what May of 2008. Mm -hmm. And I had no intention of going whatsoever. So I didn't have any money aside. didn't have any... Like I wasn't ready to do any paperwork and, but they said yes. And I thought, all right, this is it. I got to do it. Otherwise I'm just going to fizzle out and I might change career path entirely. I worked all summer in a circus in Northern England and then uh, went to Quebec city and started my circus career professionally. That's awesome. From Andrew Olson, what things outside the world of juggling have recently inspired you? Uh, recently, I think photography is still reasonably recent. I bought my first camera in 2012. Yeah. So four years ago already, I guess. Five years ago, even. But uh, more recently is in the same domain as analog photography. Like now I do a lot of, uh, a lot of film photography. Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. beautiful autofocus. Well done. <laughs> anyway, there you go. I got a huge collection of nice old cameras. Here's a couple. And that's, it gets me the, the same, same, how do you say that? The same sort of relaxation that I got from juggling at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Now juggling is 
still, I love it, but it's stressful and it's a lot mm. of hard work and it's really like you have to practice hard to get where you want to go and then you take a few days off and you lose everything. But when you start juggling, it's really, it's a stress relief. It's really relaxing and really fun and every practice is a progression. Mm. And that's how I feel about analog photography now is mm. I'll go out, take my camera and I might, in a four or five hour walk, I might take one or two photos, but it's that slowing down and thinking about every aspect of the shot because you don't want to waste film. Mm -hmm. It's definitely, it's meditative a little bit and mm -hmm. it's really, it's different from training, hard juggling and coaching people juggling all day to just go out with a camera and take a one photo is uh, is a huge relax from the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. This is from Quinn that I am interested in hearing. What are your thoughts about Ringling Brothers? Uh, <laughs> uh, in what way? Well, I mean that they're closing down. Yeah, but I mean, they're closing down, I think. And obviously, it's sad, but... I don't know. It's not something I've thought about because it's not hugely my domain of circus and although they're a huge part of the circus history i don't think i have i don't have much to comment on it and i don't want to just throw something out and insult people okay but i, mean, I just say like circus is changing I'm sure i think people's it's kind of it's zigzagging because it was all about technique and big showy flashy you know sequins and smiles circus back in the day and then people got bored of it and it became more contemporary circus. You had to have a concept and a story and we wanted to see a character on stage more than the actual person. So I think that has definitely influenced the direction of where traditional circuses are going. I've seen more and more traditional circuses doing shows that have a concept, like classic big top tours, but their shows all have a theme instead of just being you know, shiny. And Ringling, they tried it, but I feel like, I don't know. The animals were part of it. The problem is, the, and why I don't really want to go too far into it, because I'm not entirely researched in the uh, situation, but the problem seems to be the difference between fact, like what they actually, how they actually treated the animals, which seems to be very, very well, and what everyone believes and unfortunately they caved under peer pressure and because everyone thinks they're uh, a-holes they had to close down even though it might not be the truth it's what the collective has decided to be the truth but it's sad but i think it's not the end of circus in any way it's just a different it's one more venues closed down but other venues are going to open up different styles of circus new circus teams new circus companies there's i mean in quebec City alone, there's been three new circus companies in the last few years, and there's going to be more. It's just, it's a shift in circus. That's all. Wait. I can't hear you. Because I can't hear you at the moment, Sean, I'm sorry, but I'm going to answer Mr. Tricky Tricks' question. Are you planning on making Rings 4 in the future? I don't think so. And rings one, two, and three were, I like to think to an extent, revolutionary in that there wasn't a lot of people doing interesting things with rings then and everything in, especially rings three, everything in it, like, well, okay, 90% of stuff in it was either never before seen or just hardcore technique that you hadn't seen much of. These days, if I was to create a rings four, it would have to be better than rings three, which would mean it would have to be either better filmed, better edited, longer, or just filled with the most ridiculously fresh ideas. And when you're competing with like Tony Pezzo and friends, I don't think it's gonna happen. So uh, let's talk a little bit about your photography. How'd you get into <laughs> photography? Circus? Um, that was, it started, it started with videos actually. Originally, it was videos because when I, when I, when I, when I was, 
don't know, in circus school. With my friends, we were doing some skateboarding and, you know, they were doing acrobatics in the street. And there was, we were watching a lot of skate videos, a lot of beautiful videos. Brett Novak, if you don't know him, check him out, doing beautiful, beautiful video, uh, skate videos. And we were sad that that didn't exist for circus. And there were a few people doing it, but it was mostly, it was mostly not. <laughs> There are a few people doing really nice juggling videos, but otherwise it was just the racquetball shots and, you know, pure technique. And I felt like we had enough of just technique. If you want to see technique, there's enough of it. You can just go on YouTube and you can watch technique for days where there weren't any well thought out, well filmed, well edited juggling videos or not enough at least. And I wanted to see circus videos have the same kind of production love as something made by Red Bull, obviously without the million dollar budget, but you know, we can try our best. So I originally got a camera to make beautiful juggling videos. And, and where did you kind of develop your photography and videography <laughs> skills? Um, in, in doing it. <laughs> but uh, I guess I mean more specifically <laughs> your style. Yeah, well, it's Brett Novak, as I mentioned, is was a big inspiration for me. My first videos, the like Aaron Do It, was almost a direct ripoff of his skate video style, but with juggling, basically. And over time, I wouldn't say I have a style in photography more so, but in videography, it's each project is different. I think each I try to have uh, a universe that I create before going out to film and then that I solidify through the editing and through the color grading and stuff like that. I try to make every video its own little mini story. That said, I think a few trademarks, definitely musical precision. It really bugs me when there's music playing under a video that has no reason to be there. or that you miss the beat. Like if there's an obvious cue in the music and then the image doesn't change, but then like half a beat later it does, <laughs> that's really frustrating for me. Like I'm just, you were so close, just there. <laughs> so yeah, apart from those sort of things that I definitely make sure to add, it's just doing it. And it's a lot of, in copying to an extent, I'll see something I really like in a video or in a photo and I say, oh, I wonder if I can do something like that. And mm -hmm. then I'll start from that inspiration and go down that route. What's a memorable videography or photography experience you've had so far? The Aaron Do It, the first video was, is still important to me for sure because it was sort of my entry into that world. And also because we've been talking about it for months, both of us. He also really likes well-made videos. And we together, we wanted to make a nice video. We planned it. We talked about it. And it was the middle of winter in Quebec, so it's not the nicest weather. And he said, you know, whenever you want, Norby, just let me know. So one morning, I woke up. It was not too cold. I mean, you know, there wasn't any wind. And you could actually go outside and not die. So I called Aaron up and said, yeah, we're making a video right now. We went outside. We spent about an hour out in the cold, juggling with bare hands in Quebec winter for an hour. And then I came home and I just edited nonstop for about eight hours straight away as soon as I got home and then released the video. And it was... It was all on a single high. Like I woke up, I was ready, filmed it, edited, posted it, did it. That's the most important one to me still to this day. Awesome. Yeah. How do you make sure that you take interesting shots? Mm -hmm. How do you make sure you take interesting shots? I think more precisely, let's say juggling. Because... Even though I'm a juggler and I know juggling, it's still the hardest one for me to take photos of. Because juggling, by uh, definition, yeah, sure, it moves and it's beautiful when it moves. You see seven balls and it's just like, it's a visual delight. 
But if you stop it at any moment, we've all tried to take a photo of five or seven balls and there's just things dotted up everywhere and none of it looks any good. So how do you take a good juggling photo? I think is to not juggle. The three things that I try to use when I'm doing juggling photography is the architecture. I really like just photos of a cool place and I like to go out and just take photos of a nice building or a nice wall or something. So I can take something as simple as seven ball cascade, put it in front of a cool sculpture and have it complement each other, either in shape, size, or the opposition of the two. And that makes an interesting photo. Or include more body movement. Take someone who dances well when they juggle. Get a nice funky body position with some balls involved or some whatever involved. And that makes a nice shot. Or to not juggle at all, like have you know a club balance trick or a head roll or some rings placed around the body, something that isn't actually juggling. And then again, incorporate either some architectural or some lighting situation. And taking good shots, it's not something you can learn or teach. It's something you can go out and do every single day and then learn, like progress over time. But in juggling, taking a good juggling photo is actually just taking a good photo and adding juggling to it, I think. I will add on that, actually, because it was about photography, but cinematography as well. Um, think of every shot as a photo. Because, it I mean, it is a moving photo, I guess, if you want. So if I'm going to take a juggling video, or anything video, I'm going to frame it as if I'd want to take a photo first, and then you know, and then add the juggling in. That way you know that every, sh the idea of every shot as a painting is, uh, is important, I think. To, to be able to freeze frame a video at any point and print that out and put it on your wall is a really good goal for making a nice video. Awesome. Uh, let's move on to the fact that you're a teacher. Um, what was the transition like from student to teacher? <laughs> the transition from student to teacher was very much overlapped due to, without getting too personal, the juggling coach at the time in my third year at school wasn't up to date, let's say. So I was teaching eight hours a week in my graduation year at circus school, which also meant I didn't really have a juggling coach in my third year, which was a bit sad. But so the transition kind of happened already before I'd even finished school. But what's weird, the hardest thing for me is being so close to the students, both in age and also in relationship, because there's, a, there's both a lack of authority, but also, uh, addition of friendship that like I can't tell someone I can't tell someone off I can't be like stop doing that do 20 push-ups because I just say <laughs> shut up shut up Norby I'm not going to do 20 push-ups and I'm like well I'm kind of your coach and you totally should respect me but at the same time I'm your friend and obviously like that's fine I understand but at the same time because they know me personally I get to I get more respect from anecdotes. I think when you don't know your coach, sometimes it's a, it's a bit of a hard thing to believe them when they tell you, you know, in the marketplace, this probably isn't going to work and this might be a better idea and this and this and this. You don't really know who they are or you don't know them personally. It's sort of like, yeah, yeah, whatever. I'm just going to do my thing because I like doing it. Whereas I think having that personal connection with them is nice because I can say, hey, listen, from one person to another person, from one friend to another friend, I know that what you're doing is not going to work in the professional mm. like, world. So please take it from your buddy, Norby the Juggler. Don't do that. Right. So it's nice to have that and also not nice to have the lack of authority. But one thing between the two is in the staff meetings, I was a student and then a coach, and also at the same time. So surrounded by people that have been there for maybe 10 years or so, I can be like, hey, listen, 
I know you're fed up with how, uh, you know, this is how these students are reacting to this event. But listen, for me, as someone who was a year ago in their situation, you have to understand what it's like to be in that position. Mm -hmm. So having, having that like knowledge of both sides of the table helps me explain to the students why the school's making those choices and also explain to the school why the students are acting like they are. It's nice to have, yeah, I think it's important to have that like connection there. Totally. Uh, when you're coaching a student, what are you, what, what's more, most important for, to you for that student to accomplish? There's three to four years at circus school. So we start off mostly technique. I think at the very beginning, it's sort of checking their technique, making sure they're clean, making sure everything they're going to do is their bases, their foundations are solid. That's really important. And then after that, more about research towards in their own direction. And we try to guide them a bit. You know, sometimes people just want to do technique and then you say hey come on why don't you try this or if someone already has an idea you're like, okay let's push down this path and for them to finish school with their own style and to be respected either through technique or research I think to be proud of a student and it's a hard thing to put a finger on but you know when you can say like oh yeah i helped create that I don't really know what, it's not one thing in particular, but it's a mature, original, well-presented, and clean juggler. I think it's, it's a general idea of a professional performer, but what I want from a student is for them to be clean, professional, like um, punctual, you know, things like that, and to be original, to be themselves, to have their own particular style when they're performing. And yeah, it's, it's, it's a tough one to pinpoint, but it's to be a well-rounded professional, whatever that means. <laughs> awesome. Let's move on to TurboFest. How'd it go this year? Great. Yeah, yeah. TurboFest is great. Apart from a couple of injuries, which are not so great. Uh, For the first, yeah. Help yeah. out a lot with that, especially with making videos, doing promo stuff. Mm -hmm. Um. Why do you do it? Why do I help out? I love it. No, I started helping out eight years ago. So I've been the last eight out of 11 TurboFest. I've been on the organization committee. And there's a bit, okay, this might, I don't hope it doesn't come off as arrogant. It might do. But I feel like TurboFest is a little bit on my shoulders because I'm so implemented in the uh, the internet community everyone on the well, not everyone these days anyway a lot of people on the internet know who i am and what i do and the fact that turbofest is part of that i'm part of turbofest so when there's a problem when something goes wrong they sort of go hey norby this isn't working or norby why didn't you do this this year or norby they don't know it and i like, hey it's not i'm not the president or, or, or like <laughs> i'm not in charge of anything really but because I'm that sort of contact, I want to make sure that everything goes well. Also because I want the festival to go well, but there's that underlying stress of this is going to be on me if everything goes, to, <laughs> goes uh, down the drain to an extent. Totally. Well, while we're on the topic of making it go well, what would make it better even if unattainable? Nothing. It's the best festival in the world. Well, you know, we ask, we ask the people. We ask them every year. There's a, um, if you go to the Turbo Facebook page, there is a, a questionnaire to fill out. And we read every single one and we try. I think every year we've added something or we've implemented something. Like this year, for the first time, we had vegan options and gluten-free options and dairy-free options at the on-site cafeteria. And I think uh, to make it better, we don't know. Every year we're sort of like, well, this is the best we can get. And then suddenly we add something else. And the next year it's even better and better and better. 
I don't know what it takes to make it better every year, but if you tell us, then we will do our very best to try to add it. Awesome. <laughs> okay, let's go to some more questions from the viewers. So sticking with Turbo, how has your role kind of morphed over the years? Okay. From the very beginning, I was kind of a video guy. And my first, I think my first TurboFest that I helped with, second TurboFest I helped with, I edited the group video we do. And then I, that sort of, I took on the role of the guy who does the videos. So from 2010, I've been the video guy. And I wanted to sort of stay as that, but over the years, I have more of the core members have left, either gone on contract, come or else, moved out of Quebec, or just decided to take a break from the committee. I've stayed there, so now I'm uh, one of only two people that have been there for so long. And although I'm only the video guy, I also kind of follow up on everything and make sure everyone's doing everything right. Yeah. So it's changed <laughs> a little bit, but not yeah, too just, much. I know a lot of the answers now to, to problems. So I can sort of tell people, hey, you forgot to do this and you forgot to do this, you forgot to do this. Even though it's not my place to do that, I'm pretty present online. So I'm going to answer questions quickly, answer messages quickly. So I've become kind of the go-to guy for getting stuff done, whatever it may be. All right, and from Greg Phillips, still related to Turbo. Mm -hmm. Have you thought about finding a larger space? Love the school, but it's getting darn crowded. Truth. We, mm, we have thought about it. The main thing is the Circus School is, uh, is a sponsor, and they give us the Circus School, which is an enormous, beautiful space which I don't know how much it would cost in real life, but they give it to us. They're like, here, for four days, have a 24-hour party in my space. And because, because of that, it'd be kind of hard to find a bigger space. And also so central. I mean, we could go to like the Congress Center and use one of their giant halls, but it'd just be another juggling festival in the Congress Center. Like, it's just a big juggling hall and no, no atmosphere and really expensive. Whereas now we have this beautiful space, which we have sleeping on site and we can have a little canteen in the corner and we've got a lounge and we've got like to find all of those things in another place and for cheap is going to be very difficult. However, there are rumors and I don't want to <laughs> hope I'm not. Uh, sharing too much information here. But there are rumors that a second gym is going to be added to the side of the circus school in the coming years. So, so that would cool. solve all the problems. Yes. Or many of them, anyway. <laughs> what countries in the world have the best opportunities for a juggler? And has mm. this changed during your career? As a juggler, well, in mean, circus and juggling is so big. If we're talking about opportunities, professional opportunities, it depends on whether you want to do uh, like corporate events, whether you want to do street shows, whether you want to do cabarets, stuff like that. And for street shows, even that's different. In Quebec City, they love circus and they love um, artistic performance. So you can get away with doing a 20-minute street show, which is four different five-minute choreographed acts to music and hardly ever talking, and you can make... Whereas if you want to go to another country, let's say maybe the US, you're going to need to be talking a lot more and you're going to need to be doing your big finale tricks a couple of times per show more than you know, in Quebec. So there's a difference. Depends what kind of style they're going for. If you want to do more traditional circus or cabarets, then it's, it's Europe and it always, always has been. The U.S. is getting is gearing towards more contemporary circus, more and more. So that's that's definitely the future. I think U.S. is going contemporary. 
whatever they decide to call contemporary. I don't know. Like Cirque du Soleil called themselves contemporary, and let's be honest, uh, they're far from that. All right. Well, uh, let's move on to some quick fire questions. Okay. What's your favorite trick or pattern to do? Six, four, five. That was quick. What about to watch? Five pancakes. Who do you like watching do that best? Kulakov. All right. What's your uh, favorite festival? Turbo Fest. <laughs> okay, okay. Slightly slower reply. Um, European festivals are super chilled, super fun, like a whole different environment from North American festivals. And all the, all the European festivals are amazing. I went to the Berlin Festival a couple of times and food included, everyone helps out, super cheap, amazing show. One of the best festivals I ever went to. EJCs, you can't compare a week with 7,000 other jugglers. Like There's nothing like it in the world. WJF, controversial uh, reply here, but I went to WJF 1, 2, and 3, and it was one of the most like fun-filled few days ever. Everyone thinks it's all about competition and there's so much rivalry, but it was just a bunch of friends hanging out in Vegas and juggling, and then they'd go on stage for an hour and do a routine. But before and after the competition, there was zero like competitive vibe, really. But otherwise, TurboFest, I think, kind of takes everything from around the world and makes a European-ish style festival in a circus school in North America, which you can't really beat. All right. Favorite prop? Uh, rings. Favorite brand? Absolute circus rings were the best, but now they're not. So I think the play rings, the play rings are definitely the nicest at the moment. Favorite music to listen to when you're practicing? <laughs> Favorite music to do is something, uh, it depends on the practice, depends if I want to do technique, if I want to dance around and do research. But if I need energy and I need to be like, happy and pumping and going for it, then it's usually Disney. That is the best answer ever. <laughs> Your best practice tip. Ah, best practice tip. Best practice tip, I think, is not over-practicing one move. If you want to learn a trick that you haven't got yet, 15 minutes is enough. If you go over 15 minutes, you're going to just start like getting tired both physically and mentally, and then you'll make more and more mistakes. and you'll start learning to make mistakes instead of learning to not make mistakes. So 15 minute blocks, uh, try to finish on a high when possible. Even if like you come out, first try is the best you've had all week, then just stop. But, all right, this is it. I'm done with my three Diablos for today. That was the best one I've had all week. I'm not gonna keep going. Um, if you get bored and tired and you're like so unmotivated, do something else completely. That's why I started head bouncing, actually. It was because everything I wanted to practice, I was losing motivation because it wasn't going anywhere. So instead of pushing it and just getting tired of it, I switched direction and learned something new instead. All right, great advice. Um, last big question. In five years, when you look back on your juggling career, what do you want to be able to say you accomplished? <sighs> to live comfortably and happily, whether that be monetarily or emotionally, without worries. Mm. You can find me on Instagram at Juggler Norby. I post mostly my photography over there. Occasionally I'll throw in a practice video. Otherwise, the same thing on Facebook is Norby Video Photo. is like facebook.com slash Norby Video Photo. Uh, facebook.com slash Juggler Norby is my professional page on Facebook. I'm also Juggler Norby on Flickr and Twitter, but I don't use it. So, uh, Biggest inspiration is... Don't compare yourself too much. To other people i think this is a really important thing in juggling everyone wants to be the next that person 
like you see a video of uh nine clubs and you're like oh yeah i want to i want to be that guy but just be you guy first instead of being the next him be the first you juggle because you want to juggle and progress at the, the speed that you want to progress at uh, or that you can progress at and compare yourself to yourself months ago instead of comparing yourself to like someone who you want to be because everyone's different maybe that person's better in a bunch of things but maybe you're better in a couple of things too like there's just compare yourself to yourself all right sweet well uh norby thanks so much for being with us for uh, everybody else Sorry about the baby. <laughs> I think uh, I'll make sure I get a babysitter for the future. She's a lot harder to manage at this age. But thanks for tuning in. And until next time, keep on juggling. Bye. Yeah.